All right. Well, welcome everyone to this edition of Roundtable Discussions. I have with me today on the panel, Kate Gladstone, which she has been with me before. But someone new that we have today is Guy Fox. And what I would like to do is just let each of my guests just come on just for a brief moment, introduce themselves, and then I'm going to read over the, uh, the discussion rules. And this is going to also include the chat room. Please behave, okay? You know, act like the adults that you are, okay? This is Guy Fox, and uh, since uh, late September, or I mean late uh, 2016, um, I've been uploading videos, mostly started a channel to just put on record the experiences that I was having, having as I had them. And in the last uh, almost two years, it's been a very interesting, I've met a lot of interesting people, uh, to say the least, and uh, <laughs> it's it's just been good. So it's, it's great to be here. It's great to answer uh, any questions and give my take on it. Um, as honestly as I can. Well, that's what, what, what I appreciate. And that's what the whole uh, goal of, of a civil debate is, is to be able to just talk rationally both sides. And so before we even get started, I'm going to go over the rules, okay? And uh, some of this is going to apply to the chat room. And... Uh, Please, please, those of you in chat, please behave yourself, okay? Um, it's, it's distracting to those who are here trying to be serious and listen to both sides if you're making rude or obscene um, comments in the chat room, okay? So I've already had to, you know, hide, block, delete uh, two people that's come in just... If, if you say you're a Christian, please act like one. Okay, so here are my rules, okay? Uh, number one, all of the guests who have their own channel, this would be like me and Guy, we are allowed to upload any live stream that we are a guest on. So when this is done, Guy is allowed to upload this whole stream on his channel if he so chooses. And then... In return, I will be uh, doing the same like if I was a, a guest on, on his channel, okay? Number two, um, and we didn't have this problem today. Everyone was on time. You know, if, if you're going to join me on a live hangout, it would be best if everyone shows up at least 15 minutes early so that way we can check, make sure that our mics are being heard that there's no uh, last minute questions that we need to address before we go live okay number three um and, and this is important because this is what has distracted us the past couple of hangouts that i've had uh, some guests on they were not in a quiet location there was a lot of background noise you know cars uh people talking in the background that's really distracting and for people who are are wanting to understand both sides and and they're serious that's going to make people leave okay we don't want to make anyone leave because of any kind of noise or interference so if you're going to be on with me you you really have to be somewhere where it's quiet where there's really not going to be any distractions for you okay number four and this is going to apply to the um Okay, I have been trying to get this back loading blankety blank uh, out of here. Okay, I, I don't know, Mike. I know you are you are on here. Um, I'll have to see what uh, what what can be done. But please, no foul language, no um, off colored phrases, jokes, or slang either from the the panel members or, or in the the chat room okay and of course mm -hmm. uh if this happens as far as panel members you're only going to be warned once then you're going to be removed okay and this is the way it's going to be in chat because 
for me, this is serious. This is not a joke, especially when I believe that this involves uh, people's uh, eternities, where they're going to spend eternity. Okay, and then um, I would ask that all the guests that come on, please speak loudly, clearly. Try not to talk real super fast. Otherwise, people can't understand you. So just talk clearly, loudly. Make sure that your microphones are, are turned up. And uh, this is really, really important, okay? And, and I know sometimes we're all going to forget this. But no interrupting people. This includes me. Uh, this includes Kate. This includes Guy. Anybody that's on with me, please no interrupting each other. Okay? You need to really, really wait for the person who's talking to finish speaking before you respond or answer a question. Okay? Hopefully, we'll, we won't have any problem between me, Kate, and, uh, and Scott, Guy Fox. Okay? Um, <coughs> maybe when you're done talking... Let's wait a few seconds to make sure that that we're ready to proceed. And, and we'll just, you know, try to take it from there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, as far as when, when we're having this debate and we're asking questions, we've got to make the questions short, direct, to the point. No dragging it on for like minutes and minutes and minutes. Just get to the point. Make it short, sweet, direct, to the point. Okay. Now, as far as answering a question, I realize that some answers will require a little bit more time. Still try to keep it as uh, brief and clear and concise as you can. If the person uh, maybe doesn't understand what you just said, then obviously there's time for clarifying a question. But we want to try to move, move this debate along get as many questions in that we all are obviously going to have. And so try to keep it uh, as, as brief as possible. Okay. And obviously we're not going to attack each other. There has to be common courtesy and uh, respect. Okay. You know, so no name calling, no foul language. And I really don't want to have to, break up, you know, like a quote unquote fight because people are interrupting to where I have to start yelling to get over the tops of other people's voices to like break it up. Okay. We, we cannot have this. We, we just cannot. Okay. Um, and so we don't attack people based on their personal belief or unbelief in in whatever the topic of a hangout that I'm going to have might be. Oh, and obviously David. respect. We, we really just need to respect each other. Okay. Um, and so everyone all the way around, please let's just respect each other. Okay. So that's, um, that's basically all I, uh, all I have as far as, you know, just, just my rules for, for this hangout, this debate. Okay. Guy, why don't you go ahead, Scott, why don't you go ahead and maybe tell us uh, a little bit more about, uh, and I know you already mentioned this briefly, maybe uh, take, take a few minutes to maybe expound on how you heard about the Mandela effect. And I, I would be interested in when did you find out, like, or, or hear about the Bible changes? Okay, so okay. me and Kate, we'll, we'll be quiet so you can thoroughly mm -hmm. answer the question. A lot of people have also seen the video that I did. Um, I don't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but back in uh, 2016, September 23rd, I knew I did not know that September 23rd was any kind of a special date, so that just happened to be a coincidence, but it was a Friday night, and... Um, Life was at my all-time low. Um, life was pretty rough. And I was uh, pretty broken. I had been living for a while <clears throat> trying to exert my own will over this world and create uh, a reality that uh, I thought was the American dream and the corporate ladder. And I was at a state of, of misery at that time. And I'd been in that state for, for a while. But on that particular evening, 
I would say I was, I was probably at my lowest depression I've ever felt. And, uh, I prayed and I hadn't prayed in a long, long time. And I had prayed for God. If he was listening to just let me die, to just allow me to be done with this world because I was so tired of being here. And I gave it an earnest prayer that I just wanted to be done. And I didn't want it to hurt because I'm a wuss. I did not want a painful exit, a quick, whatever it could be. But I just wanted to be out. If he would do that, it would be wonderful. At a la and as a last uh, closing remark, I said, or just take over my life. Take it over completely because I don't have the strength or the energy to go on anymore here. And then I woke up a few hours later in the morning and uh, to say the word that a person had a religious experience would be such of an understatement. I felt God come down around and in me. I heard his voice. I heard clearly and felt and understood his presence. And I understood more better than any when, when Moses said he had to take off his sandals because he was on holy ground. I felt holiness as a solid, just a solid rock solid. It was incredible. The acceptance that was communicated was just mind blowing. And <laughs> I walked out of that office. I, I hadn't been, uh, my wife and I hadn't been being, weren't too close at the, at the time. And uh, I remember walking past her. I just had this huge experience. I mean, I'd been sobbing. My eyes were red probably still. We walked past each other in the house, and there was just this horrible spirit of hostility. And, and she said, I want a divorce. And uh, I just said, okay, let's, let's talk about it later. I had to run. And, uh, and that's where it started. And I had prayed to God when I prayed that morning, the Lord's prayer from memory and old memory. And I had asked God, um, and every part of that prayer meant so much. And the big, the big one was let thy will be done. God, let your will be done. I don't want to, to, to have to take over this planet or this world. I just want you to do it. I want you to rule my life. And when I say this world, I mean the world around me, my marriage, my job, my kids, my world. And when my wife wanted a divorce, I was, I was going to, I just gave it over to God. God, if this is what you want, then let that be your will. Whatever your will is in this situation, I turn it over. And I, I did not fight. I did have I had no anger. I, God had told me in that conversation, how it was just very important to release forgiveness to everyone all the time, continuously, to be honest in everything I do and to live right. That was very, very strong. So releasing forgiveness was big. And, and within about three days of this happening, I was just at the house. I was on the sofa and I was just questioning because for a long time I'd been buying into a lot of different theologies and ideologies and theories, scientific, non-scientific. And I just said out loud, I said, God, I'm really curious how old. No, I did. I was thinking, I was thinking about how old the earth is. Right. And I was like, God, is there anything about reality that you want me to know? So I was thinking God's going to tell me about how old the earth was because of this archaeology documentary questioning how old the earth is and the, the stuff that they uncover in, in archaeology. I don't know if you've ever looked into that stuff, but you know the, the whole industry, people have lost their jobs for saying stuff that doesn't follow the line. So I wonder how, how old, and instead of answering that question, God... Um, Within three hours, I think, of that prayer, I saw an article on my phone pop up, a BuzzFeed, news feed, whatever it is, and it was talking about someone who I knew died without a doubt. Just a couple of years prior, he had died, absolutely no doubt. And I went to my son, and who we had the conversation when he died, and everybody I knew, and I had this article on my phone, and I was showing it to everybody, and I started reading it to him. I was like, how can this guy be alive still? And on the and and because of that, I started coming across this thing called the Mandela effect. But on the fourth day, I was showing that that article to my boss actually, and it it changed back. He was dead again. So <laughs> it, we well, the guy was alive, and then he went back to dead in the article. The article just changed. So I was 
really trying to figure out what the um, whole idea of the Mandela effect was, but I was also starting to see things that normally I would not see in physical reality. And I was seeing a, a, a lot of things and I was seeing things change right before my eyes. Um, by this point, it was about one weekend. My wife saw how real this was to me. She saw me walk out of a room one time right after seeing the words change the lyrics that I was looking at on a song that was un in question. And the song was uh, Phil Collins in the air tonight. And I had always known that song to have ended, hold on, repeating over and over and over, hold on, hold on. It was always hold on. And it was supposedly never hold on. And I'd read, no, there's no way it has to be a hold on. And I'd looked up the lyrics online and every lyric I saw was, oh Lord. So I found one thumbnail that had the lyrics going across and I could see on that thumbnail, hold on. So I went into my office to, to play that thumbnail. I played it. It came across big and bold across the screen and I could see and Phil Collins started to sing the words and I could see the words. And when he got to the hold on right at that moment, when he was singing, hold on, it changed to, Oh Lord, right before my eyes. And I felt the blood just drain from my face and I couldn't stop shaking. I came out of that office. My whole family was what, what happened? Because it was like, you know, the expression, you just saw a ghost or something. And I, I was shaking and trembling and I told him what I just saw. And uh, I said, I think that might be a sign of the, the rapture, maybe, because in the air tonight and hold on, oh, Lord. I, I said, I don't know, but this is weird. And, and we actually all got on our knees and prayed <laughs> and surrendered. I mean, my wife had not been a Christian for a long time, and she, she changed completely that day. Um, different people, 180-degree differences. I've got one recording where I'm interviewing one of my employees and we're talking about both the Mandela effect and the and the um, the experience with uh, Jesus. And I asked him, "Have I become a different person? You've known me for many years. Have I become a different person?" And he said, "A hundred and eighty degree different personality. You are not the same person you were." Well, I can, uh, let me make sure. Can you hear? Can you hear me? I just I, I tried to delete my my. Uh, mute my mic in, in case there was you know background noise now you were talking about the the song phil collins and and i i was really earnestly trying to listen to what what you uh, said i'm also trying to monitor the chat room i mean just shame on 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 these people okay y'all are going to answer to god that that are i mean this man just poured out his heart you ought to be ashamed of yourselves Okay? I don't take this lightly. Okay? Now, you were talking about that song by Phil Collins. Okay? I know what song you're talking about. The comment or, or response I have is, have we not all heard a song one way just to find out Oh, that's not the words of the song. Now, even myself, it sounds like he's saying, Oh, Lord. Okay. Now, has anybody uh, actually asked Phil Collins? I mean, is there a uh, uh, an interview that, that was captured? Because this is one of those things that there's many songs, honestly, that I've listened to and my ears think it says something and I'll be singing along in the car and somebody's with me. And, you know, you, you kind of feel stupid when they say, you know, that's not what the song lyrics really are, right? And, and then they tell you what the song lyrics are. And then you're like, okay, then you hear it again. And then you can hear what that person said. But for some reason, I, I think it could be, could it be just how we, we all are individually hearing things. I mean, that, that may not honestly have uh, been any kind of an answer to you, Scott, but yeah, there's times I can, you know, hear him saying, hold on. But the way Phil Collins sings, uh, it would be very easy to mistake it for, you know, 
oh lord you know all on you know or you know i mean do, do you kind of see see what i mean by that absolutely if if this were just one one thing or two or three or five or ten i would probably discount it in fact i did for quite a while because many many years ago i had one hit me and i couldn't reconcile why because i knew i knew i had a, such an anchor memory of this thing but I couldn't, you know, I see how it could have changed. So I just dismissed it. I said, it just, it's not possible. And several of these that have happened to me, I have dismissed them over and over and over. And I, I don't know why God is allowing me to see them, but it's, it's seen in real time change and experiencing the changes right before my eyes. So where you remember, hold on, or old, you remember, hold on. Well, I, 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 I've heard it both. Okay. And it well, could have yeah, just been yeah. the way my ears were hearing it, y you know? <sighs> well, I've, I have researched it pretty good, and officially, it's always been, oh, Lord. But I, uh, I found sometimes these things do change. Well, when when did you say you? Because I, I might have missed this when I was trying to, you know, listen to you and and keep an eye on chat. When did you say you first started hearing about, um, you know, the the Mandela effects? I mean, when, when it was, when, was, was within it, a few days of that September twenty three experience. What, what 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 year was that? Uh, twenty sixteen. Okay, so two thousand. So few months later basically than when when i heard about it because i heard about it at the end of may 2016 right okay well um i don't kate do you have anything that you would like to add at this point yes i would first like to say that i was i'm very thankful to scott for being so brave and forthcoming to share his very personal experiences and it's not my place ever to tell anyone that their experience was wrong or any of that. However, I would like to point out that even things like seeing something change before your eyes, which you said happened to you, this is, as Wendy points out, something that can happen with our, you know, with our ears and with our eyes when we see a glimpse of something or we hear something, our brain likes to fit it into patterns that are easy to think, patterns that make sense to us. And because a lot of people's brains work sort of alike, a lot of times those patterns will be pretty commonplace, but they're still wrong. I would like to give you a very every, everyday example. If you go into a school and you're in math class in second grade or third grade or whenever the people are learning the multiplication tables, assuming they still are, who knows where education is going this way, and the teacher gets up into sort of the higher numbers like, you know, seven times eight, you'll find that a lot of the kids in the classroom, you know, won't remember 56. That's notoriously one of the more difficult ones. They'll remember things that are almost there, but not really like 58 or 42. And I know it very often happened when I was in second grade and we were learning the multiplication tables that at the certain times, you know, there would be a majority of people in the classroom who, if, if the teacher asked what seven times eight, more than half of them would be saying, you know, 52 instead of 56, which it really is. Now, just the fact that 52 is easy to think and it's easier somehow than 56 or why would so many people make that mistake? The fact that a majority goes wrong or at least goes wrong at certain times does not make it right. Now, if the kids had been... Mandelaites, if that notion had been in the air then, I suppose they all could have stood up and said to the teacher, you know, but Mrs. So-and-so, I totally clearly remember it was 52. I totally clearly have this memory that when I looked at my math book, I remembered 52. And even if they looked, when you have a wrong idea in your head and you're looking at some source which contradicts it, which contradicts what you expect to see, 
it often takes a while for what you see outside your skull to percolate inside your skull. And I can tell you that this can be experienced as seeing something change to something else. A few years ago, I was in a city in Canada. I was visiting Canada with my husband and I was in a part of Canada where the fire hydrants are yellow, which I was not used to. They have never been yellow in any place other than there that I've actually visited. And the first time I saw a yellow fire hydrant, what I thought I saw was a little kid or a midget in a yellow, bright yellow Charlie Brown shirt. It was just the same color as Charlie Brown's t-shirt on television. And then, of course, as I was looking at it, you know, I sort of made sense of, oh, this isn't a kid. It's a, this isn't a child. This is a fire hydrant painted a color that I just never saw a fire hydrant be painted before. Now, I suppose I could have said, oh, well, until now I was in a world where a little child was standing on the corner in a yellow T-shirt. And now I'm in a world where it's a fire hydrant and the world changed right before my eyes. But I didn't. I just realized that my senses were giving information to my brain and my brain was taking a little while to interpret what was really out there rather than what my brain thought was more possible to be out there. I agree. Thank you. So I, I, I had considered that um, eyes playing tricks on me thing. And I, I've seen a lot of these that were such of a rapid fraction of a millisecond fast. You, you do it, you know, you, you blink your eyes. Like, what did I just see? Um, mm -hmm. And I've tried to, you know, I, as I've looked at these, I've tried to, when I explain my experiences as much as possible, try to give a, a gauge of how my certainty ranges, because some of these things I had freely admit, I, I could be wrong. There's a percentage of me that's not a hundred percent with some things. It's just a memory. For example, um, you know, stovetop stuffing. Mm -hmm. Do you remember who, who always made that? No, I don't happen to. Never did stuffing. I mean, stove top it, stuffing. I don't remember what company made it. I, I haven't eaten it in years because I just like it too much. <laughs> I had always remembered stovetop stuffing. For me, that was a lock. There was there the, the instantly as soon as it was mentioned. Um, but I didn't see that change before my eyes. I did not watch that change, but I have such of a strong memory of years and years and years of watching um, the commercials where they were known as the the stuffing people. The ho it wasn't holiday without Stouffer's. Mm -hmm. I, I knew Stouffer's. So that was, excuse me, Stouffer's was a wasn't it a different company from Stovetop Stuffing? Well, for me, it was always Stouffer's Stovetop Stuffing, but Stouffer's has sure, never done Stouffer's. Sure it was not. That it was not Stouffer's. I think I would have remembered. I think I would have yeah. remembered it being Stouffer's. Stouffer's did and does have stuffing, but it's a different brand. I don't remember. Right, it is a different brand. So that's one where I would say I have this extremely strong memory, but I didn't see it change before my eyes. But yeah, I have seen almost on a weekly basis something change, and a lot of times it's a hard change. Uh, one, if if I were to to, to rank them. Um, when this happened for me in late September, the biggest thing that was on the news on a daily basis was the election campaign. Donald Trump, mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton. I saw Hillary Clinton on the news every single day. Mm -hmm. And at this point, I was discussing and looking at things that people were noting as Mandela effects. And at that time, every single day, I was looking at the news with a Hillary Clinton who spelled her name with one L. Mm -mm. Just one L. And people were saying, you know, she's supposed to have two L's. This is a Mandela effect. I saw videos. I participated in blogs. Now, on election day, on the day of election, I, I, I saw that uh, there was this, this cat. I was involved with Facebook for a little while. When I first started this, I was doing some Facebook groups. I'm really mm -hmm. not a Facebook kind of guy though. And I, I kind of don't, I'm not active anymore, but at the time I was doing the Facebook and I saw this, this somebody, this picture of mother Teresa talking about mm -hmm. abortion and Hillary Clinton. And I noticed that they spelled in the meme Hillary with two L's. And I thought 
in the what what we call residual evidence i thought that was like a little piece of the memory of her having two two l's so i i posted that picture and i put the question mark is it hillary with one l or hillary with two and my wife saw it she was at work she saw me post that but when i got home the post was gone it was it was removed and election night was going on and as we're watching the election i'm noticing mm -hmm. that the, the screen with the words going across the bottom kept revealing hillary's name with two l's and i said look at that it's got two l's and i i, I just couldn't did it change so i go to the computer and i look up hillary clinton and everywhere i looked hillary has got two l's i was like oh i got to go back to the blogs and the videos and the people i was talking to about this and the people in real life and none of it was there it was all gone the conversations that people had with me were gone and this is something that I'd been talking about for weeks. <laughs> and that was not the only one, though. I experienced the same thing with some others. But Hillary in the election was just yeah. so solid. Well, so Hillary was a big one. And if I may share my own, it's very different Hillary Clinton experience. No, I never <coughs> met her. You know, I run into her name. Now, I remember that, you know, not too long ago, Hillary with one L was the way that most people spelled that name, you know, when I was growing up. I'm 55. And if you were so, if that was what you were used to and you heard the name on the radio or on TV and it wasn't written down, you would assume, okay, that's how it's spelled. The two L spelling did get to start start to get more popular actually a few years before Hillary Clinton was in the news. If you look at baby name books and that happens to be, she, the evidence is that she has always used that spelling. But I remember when she started to be big in the news, I remember that I would, you know, see people write about her or whatever, and a lot of people would write about her with one L, I would say, no, it's two L's. I remember what I see. I tend to win spelling bees. I'm a crummy typist, but nobody gives spelling bees by typewriter. And I would get into arguments with people and I would prove it. I would go get, you know, a book or a newspaper or a magazine article and I would show people, see, two L's. And they would actually be angry at me because, you know, how could it possibly be two L's? This is, this is just bizarre. And they would be sort of irritated at me for being able to show in print that I was right. And remember, this was decades before the Mandela effect. You know, some of this was, you know, even before there was, you know, much of the internet or email. I believe that a lot of what's happening when we're unsure about names or words that might be spelled two different ways, and Hillary is a perfect example. It's very easy in a lot of type fonts. When you look at I's and L's close together, your I sort of loses count of them. As a semi-professional calligrapher and an amateur typographer and font designer, I'm very familiar with this, and it's amazing how many fonts are so badly designed that they can be misread out of the corner of your eye. And then again, most of us, even though people read, people write, people spend all kinds of time on the internet or reading anything else, most famous people, you hear their names maybe 10 or 20 times before you see them once. You, if you hear someone's name or any word before you see it, you're sort of on your own figuring out the spelling unless you run and look something up and it happens to be in the dictionary or whatever and if you have if you have a memory of learning about someone famous and a memory of hearing her name and a memory of seeing your name her name in your mind's eye those memories can all sort of blend together and you will be sure of this now, one way in which I see it also is, and you might think this is a sort of silly example, I, I'm a tutor. My subject is specifically handwriting. And one of the things I sometimes have to do is work with kids 
to make sure that they can read cursive, you know, irrespective of whether they learn to write it, it's still out there to be read. And very, very often I find little children who are in second grade, third grade, they've been learning cursive. They've been struggling with it and they are prepared to swear on a stack of Bibles that their teacher told them that a lowercase cursive M has four bumps. When as we know, the cursive one has three bumps. Lowercase cursive N has two bumps. A printed N just has one, but a printed M has two. And when kids are trying to sort it out, going from print to cursive, they literally lose track of what has how many bumps, and they are prepared. They are prepared to tell you that their that their teacher showed them lowercase cursive M has four bumps in cursive, which it doesn't. They're prepared to swear, and they will swear, that this was in the workbook. And literally, if you bring out that book and show them, see, it's got three. You know, if, if you uh, show them this, some of them will write at first. They'll say, no, no, no. I know it had, you know, four. I, something must have happened to the book. And fortunately, when they're little children, we can nip this in the bud. We can basically persuade them that the book didn't magically change in front of their eyes or magically change when they weren't looking. And they, you know, and little children are not necessarily going to be able, you know, to make that, you know. But, the, but we wouldn't accept this from children. I mean, maybe we shouldn't accept this argument from older people either. This is all I'm trying to say. Well, I, I think, you know, because I'm trying to, to stay uh, up to date with, with the chat. Um, I, I don't think we can discount learning things wrong at all, okay? Because as human beings, we are, uh, number one, we are not God. We are not infallible. We all have uh, learned things wrong. I mean, I, I've said this before. If you guys think your memory is just that good, okay, then can all of you uh, tell me what you had to eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and everything you wore five years ago, ten years ago? Now, be honest. Can you tell me that? You know, and, and I'm just asking this as, as, as like a general question. I'm not necessarily addressing this to Scott. But see, if I can't even remember what I ate, sometimes we, we can't even remember what we ate or even what we wore yesterday, then what makes us think, um, you know, and, and I'm... I'm trying to you know like tie this into the biblical okay because while, while i understand people get all all wrapped up in the um the the secular side of it i i understand that it's it's somewhat fascinating but when it comes to the bible where do you draw the line i mean i guess that would be my question for you scott okay. where do you draw the line and I mean, what does the Bible mean to you? Or maybe tell me, how were you raised sure. with, you know, um, were, what age did you accept Jesus Christ? I mean, what, what's been your experience? I mean, yeah, go, go, go ahead, Scott. So, yeah, and first of all, I, I need to acknowledge that, that your argument and Kate's argument that people misremember things is not one that I dispute. I, I don't think that memories are perfect. I know that people mistake things, and, and you are in the majority on that one. Very few people in the world, Christian or not, very few people, 99%, I suppose, will go along with saying that reality can change and that you could see it change right before your eyes. And when I say that I'm seeing it change and experiencing fundamental shifts that are incredible on a weekly basis, their only conclusion really has to be that I'm either insane or that I'm lying. And I've noticed people getting on the Mandela um, videos and, and things like that, just making videos. And I've questioned if there was a motive there to 
grab the popularity of this for another agenda to promote an ideology, a belief system. It, it is a way to, to do that. And I've questioned the sincerity and the beliefs. Uh, I, I've, I've questioned the honesty to be, you know, that's, that's what I've questioned, but I can't, I can't say, you know, they're, they're having to make that decision themselves. If they're being honest about their experiences, the, the thing that I've found is people take honesty for granted. So, so much, they, they break that rule. And God has put that rule in our hearts. He's written a mo moral code in every person. And we know when we break it. And the first times we break it, we know it more than ever. And then we just kind of lose our sensitivities. So people will exaggerate the truth. People will lie. They will outright lie if they feel that helps them make their point. And they, they don't understand how bad that is for their own soul. Their own soul is hurt. Their own soul is weakened. And enemy, there's enemy forces that can step in and take over when people do willingly uh, participate in being dishonest with themselves, with God, and with others. So for me, my experience with, with believing in God, I, I, I read the Bible through when I was six, no, when I was, gosh, teenager, 14, and uh, 13, 14, it was right in there, I think 14. I did not read the King James version. I thought it was too stuffy and formal, and I I didn't like it. So I'm I'm not coming as an expert in King James version. I did read the Bible. I became um, interested in in spiritual matters of such. I I became a leader in the community among teenagers and the high school. I participated in a lot of youth concerts and Christian functions, and I I received a scholarship to go to. Uh, college and was going to become a pastor at one point. So that was that was my uh, beginnings as a young man, and I left that um, faith in my mid twenties and had steered away from that for a long time. Okay, but now what what was your belief in scripture? I mean, this was obviously well before you heard of the Mandela effect and. You know, uh, did did I hear you correctly that um, you were not a, a KJV reader in your earlier years? I mean, I, I wasn't either until two years ago. I mean, it's not that I, you know, had never read the KJV, but, you know, like when, when I went to school, I, I read um, other translations because that's what the school used, like NIV and, and, and so forth. But, I mean, I had always been, you know, in the Word, in Scripture, since I was six years old. So, um, I, I, I guess, uh, what was your personal belief as far as, what were you always taught as far as, okay, is Scripture God's Word? Were you taught, okay, this is our final authority, this is like God-breathed, God-inspired? Go ahead, Scott. Yes, I think that's that's probably part of a lot of the issue with uh, a lot of Christians talking about the Bible changes and the, they, they're finding disagreement. Um, rather than it being a conversation about this has changed, no it hasn't, this is, yes it has, no it hasn't, back and forth, uh, we need to have the right foundation. We need to have the same foundation. So, um, obviously, there's there's a difference in what each person sees the Bible as. Um, when people and we, I remember, I remember this topic come up. We, there was a lot of topics that came up when I was a Bible major, and a, a lot of the uh, things that might be considered controversial were brought up because we figured our our faith needs to be able to stand up to questioning, and we need to be able to question what we believe. And uh, there's there's some um, people out there that that were strong in my classroom. There were people that strongly believed in verbal dictation that when the bible says every jot and tittle will not change it meant that as literal as it could be and that every every word in the bible was exactly as god intended it and there could be no other way they didn't believe there was any errors in the bible as far as reporting um you know what things that seem to be blatantly contradictory as far as the historical record if you were to look at it historically there are verses in the Bible that don't match up on, on different things. And a lot of people believe the Bible was to be read like a historical factual book, while others believe that 
there's an inspired message in there and that the Bible never claimed to be completely history, factual in every way, or that there's this, this idea that, um, of, of inerrancy, and the Bible actually never claims that either. It never claims inerrancy. Okay, can you explain that? I mean, you're you're kind of touching on this like, well, this is what, you know, various people believe. I mean, some people believe in the uh, inerrancy of, of Scripture, and, and some people believe, you know, that it's ever jot and tittle. But uh, and unless I, I missed, I didn't hear what your personal stand was on on this issue before the Mandela effect. So, yes, back in the early 90s, I had to question this myself along with many of my classmates. Do I think that the Bible might have some errors in it? And do I believe that it's inspired by God still? Do I still do I think it's a valid book? And I do believe it's it. I do believe it's inspired in concept, but I don't think that everything in there that was written at the, the time is necessarily applies to today. And there are things in the Gospels. When we studied the Gnostic Gospels, we pointed out events in Jesus's life that the details would be different from one Gospel to the other. Does that take away from the message? I don't think so. Whether or not Jesus rode in on one don donkey or if he straddled two donkeys, that is not, to me, uh, a point of of taking away from the message or the inspiration. In fact, we pointed out that the the writer of that one with the two donkeys, where he straddles two donkeys, is probably taking the literary device that was used in the Old Testament, where where it talked about Jesus riding in on a donkey, and then it repeated itself twice. And the writer was more than likely taking that very literally and had him riding on two donkeys, where the other gospels don't do that. And that's just one example. There's a lot of evidence in the old. Uh, testament, the kings and the, the the historical accounts that there were different manuscripts and writing that were combined because you will have the same account happen, the same story almost, but it's just slightly different. It was like they were packed together. Uh, that doesn't deter me from seeing the inspired message and that God does give us a message. Now, people do disagree on what the overall message is of the Bible. But I feel pretty consistently, and that's why I don't feel like we should throw the Bible out, or the baby out with the bathwater. I think the Bible still says, and it's still an overall example, that we are that we, we need Him. That that standing by ourselves and trying to live our own way always leads to destruction, and and God always has to bring us back. He has to break us, just like He broke me. He has to break us so that we do ask for help. We need to realize we can't make it on our own. We need to ask him for his help to get out of this mess because sin is an infection and it's a, throughout this entire whole world. And the message of the, the Bible is that sin has separated us from God and he, he, he set up a solution in the death of his son. God incarnate came to earth, died on the cross for our sins so we would have an avenue back to him. But we just got to ask. We just... There's so much of the Bible where people are trying to do it on their own. The story of Nebuchadnezzar, he thought he was, he thought he was God and had everybody worshiping him. And God gave him mercy by making him crazy for seven years, and he was humbled by it, and he turned over to God. Um, that message is throughout the Bible, but not everybody agrees with me that that's the main message of the Bible. Well, um, I, I guess my, my question and, and my honest concern would be is... If you, and, 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 and I certainly am not wanting to, to make this come out wrong, but um, if you can't, or, or you have a hard time believing that, that God would uh, absolutely provide a, a way that we would have his inerrant words, because, I mean, after all, he's God, he's omnipotent, he's omnipresent isn't that limiting god's power in if he says as um isaiah 12 not isaiah psalm 12 6 and 7 the words of the lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times thou shalt keep them o lord thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever 
that to me sounds like that's pretty concrete. God says he's going to do it. To say otherwise, is that not calling God a liar? No, I don't. Hello? Go ahead. Yeah, I'll just introduce Oh, you. yeah, Bill's on. Bill, Grace Gospel Evangelism. Um, I asked him to uh, to just kind of uh, jump in here. Uh, did you want to um, say something uh, and, and maybe introduce yourself just a little bit and, and, and maybe kind of hel hel help me with this question there, Bill? Well, yeah, yeah, I'm Grace Gospel Evangelism, and that's uh, what I am and who I do. I'm an evangelist in England. And I proclaim the, the pure gospel of grace. So that's a quick intro. My name is Bill. If you if you want to use me, you know, for name's sake, you can call me Bill. But I just, you know, I wanted to quickly jump in because when you said, you know, and as, and obviously it's, it's a beautiful passage in the Psalms, 12, 6 to 7, where it says, you know, the words of the Lord, you know, are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace earth, purified, no, Seven times, number of perfection. Thou shalt keep them over. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. And what, what is amazing, what is absolutely beautiful, if you trace back the Texas Receptus from the Koine Greek and to the King James, that's exactly seven. Exactly seven translations that have been preserved forever. Now, we've got two choices. We could say that's coincidence. We could say God is a liar. Or we can say and be honest with ourselves, yea, let God be true and every man a liar. And he did keep to his promise. I just want so, to tug that in because you trace it back through the Texas receptors to the King James, the Bishops, the Geneva, the Great, the Matthew, Covenant, Tindall. You trace it back. Seven from the original has been absolutely preserved i know we've got hundreds and hundreds of you know versions now and this is where this is where a lot of controversy and confusion comes in i remember as a little child because we do in england not so much now but you know as a little child in england everyone had the, the common prayer book and the lord's prayer in there is different to what you know you'd see the lord prayer you know in the actual king james bible and, and that even that is called you know, a lot of issues because children grew up they knew the lord's prayer obviously knew it in the common common english and you know when they actually get a bible for themselves especially a king james bible which is i believe in the english language the preserved the purified seven times bible they suddenly notice it different and then they say oh there's been a change there's been a mandela effect Oh, CERN's opened up, quantum bubbles and all sorts of silliness. When in actual fact, no, it's, it's what you've cognitively learned as a child. And then when you grow up and you read the King James for yourself, you will notice these differences because they are different. One's a common English prayer book, which is not every English speaking language has. And what they're taught from, from year dot, from three years old onwards. And so, you know, they, they suddenly, you know, mature they buy their own bible they grow up and they read the scriptures for themselves there's so much that can be explained in what other people think is as a change or something else it's really not a change it's just cognitive issues over the years and you know when you grow up you get the meat of the word in the king james you suddenly say oh that sounds different oh maybe it's changed and and, and that, is, that that that's just one factor and, and that's a factor that is really hitting hard that people have grown up with one translation, one kind of, or even all right from the parents understanding of the Lord's prayer, etc. And when they actually get a bowl for themselves, it looks different. And that's a shame when you have 25 million different translations. You know, I'm, I'm quite happy with the good book. I believe the final authority in the English language can't speak for the French or the Spanish or the Japanese or Koreans or anyone else, but for the English, you know, tracing it back from the Texas receptors, the Koine Greek, all the way from Antioch, not the Alexandrian texts, which are corrupted and which a lot of people chuck in in modern translations, but the pure, pure, purified 
seven times scripture in the King James Bible. Thought I'd just chuck that in because you brought up, you brought up, uh, you know, obviously Psalms 12, 6 and 7. Can you, can you repeat that for me? Uh, I'm trying to remember that verse and what the question was. I, uh, I know it's pure, pure, pure word. What, what else? What were you talking about in uh, Psalms 12, 6? I think there was a question to me, but I'm not sure. Oh, just about uh, how can you, um, it, it, it's like, doesn't that limit God to where, I mean, how, how can you think that God somehow hasn't uh, given us, um, as, as his people, the his, his inerrant word? It, it's like you, I mean... And and I'm 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 sorry I may not be explaining this correctly, but it, it just seems like it's it's a shame for for believers in Jesus to think that well maybe God did preserve His words somewhere out there, but oh shucks I don't know where it might be, but I mean I I guess he 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 did. Well, that's why I brought up Psalm 12, 6, and 7, because it says he did. Okay, I'm going to have to pull, it, pull that verse up. Psalms 12. And I, I can't screen share it on this no, I, 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 well, I, I apologize about Psalms that. You 12, know. Psalms 12, uh, Psalms 6, 12 and 6, and 7. 7. Which, uh, okay, which version? Uh, KJV. Okay, is that the, is that the, is... Is that the which version is would you say is the That's most inspired? The that if you trace, I, I, I don't I just think that that if you trace all the way from the Koine Greek to the English language, that's six seven, and English language being the most common spoken now from the Koine Greek from Antioch all the way through to the King James Bible, that is the translation. Anything else that use Coptic text, Gnostic text, Alexandrian text, uh, papacy text, all manner of corrupted text, but the, the original Koine Greek all the way through finishes at the King James Bible being the seventh, being the purified. Okay, so I, I, I'm getting, if I'm understanding you correctly, the correct true word of god is the original king james bible is that correct it, it's it, in the english language which is the most common language now if you trace it back you know as i've done king james geneva bishop tindale you go all the way back you land up with the the, the coiny greek which came from antioch which is the original text but does it say that anywhere in the bible what the, what it says that in Psalms twelve six seven it doesn't say it, God's not going to say oh and by the way in two thousand and eighteen Bill's going to come on a hangout and say it so, no it's not going to say that but you have to glean that that's what the Holy Spirit does it, so it the other versions that. though would not be as accurate as the King James the no no, King no, James. no 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 so this no. this verse here that says the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace purified seven times thou shalt keep them O Lord Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So that's, is that you saying that this King James Version is unchangeable or so that, that, that you're, you're, you're sticking to the King James Version though? Now that's, that's how, if you was to go, if you was to trace it back again to the Geneva Bible, uh, uh, Wycliffe, Bishop's Bible, you trace it all the way back, look at the translations, then look in the original Koine Greek, that's basically what it says, but obviously transliterated, translated in English. Wouldn't, Wouldn't the original it? language be even more pure? Well, yeah, it's, well, it, it, but most people don't speak Koine Greek. Um, that's, if you look at the Koine Greek, because you can't or go... Hebrew, Koine, for that matter, you know. Yeah, but, you know, <laughs> we're talking about New Testament, uh, you know, the Septuagint, if you want. But, yeah, even if you look, even if you look at the Hebrew text, you will see that's what it says but obviously because there's different structures etymology but and language issues would, would you acknowledge that there's a lot of christians i don't even know the percentage but there is a lot from my, my experience a majority of christians 
that do not believe that the old King James version is the, the true pure one. They believe that this is inspired in concept and that all the versions have a different way of saying it and understanding the holistic meaning is they, more... They, 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 yeah, well, yeah, because yeah, you have many Christians who have babes in Christ, many have not studied I, etymology or hermeneutics yeah, or anything like that, so they wouldn't, they wouldn't grasp that. This is why you need teaching. This is why you need to get into the meat of the word and you've got to trace things back. That's what... That's well, what let, let me add something here too, Scott, okay? And this is what made me become a KJV only reader, okay? When when I um, heard about the Mandela effect and, you know, supposed Bible changes, uh, it's not that, that I had never read the KJV. I was just starting to learn about, you know, the other corrupted translations, okay? But when... I could see for myself that the Bible changes only deals with the KJV. I had to really, really stop and look at that, okay? The only exception that they will say is like Isaiah eleven twelve. okay? All translations say wolf when it's supposed to say lion, okay? We understand that all translations are going to say wolf in Isaiah eleven six, 6, but Everyone is, is, as far as Bible changes, video after video, it's not thousands of videos against the NIV, the NASB, or the New Living Translation. What translation is it against, Scott? It's against the KJV. Well, I had to look at that and I had to say, why is it only against the KJV? Okay, because Jesus says in Scripture that... You know, if Satan cast out Satan, he can't stand. It's a house divided against itself. Well, Satan has no, uh, no, no real benefit to attack uh, his scriptures, you know, his counterfeit scriptures, your corrupted ones. So where, where does 99.9% .9 of the attacks come in? It comes against the KJV and the KJV only. That's when I really started researching the history of the KJV and and what uh, Brother Bill said is true about it going back uh, seven times, okay? Because I've got like this really neat little diagram, and, and if you give me permission, I will send that to you in email, okay? It's, it's very detailed, Okay, but it, it shows the the purified seven times all the way back to Antioch. But on the other side, it's going to show you the wild gourds, the wild vine, the poison in the pot. Okay, it, 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 it'll be a, a deep study and, and everything's on there for you to do um, a, a separate Bible study on your own. You'll probably find it fascinating. But if you'd like, I am happy to to email that to you after our hangout this evening. Yeah, that'd be fine. But I have taken hermeneutics as well, I should say. And, you know, one of the, the things that um, is also pointed out is you can, you can take, take any um, verse, really, and it's going to, people can interpret things differently, too same words they're going to apply it to themselves differently and it happens in everyday life all the time i've never adopted the position that there's just one translation that's right i've seen uh, a whole message in a lot of the translations so i haven't i don't have the purest approach that you do and that's probably part of it because i don't see that as being an issue i definitely don't see that as a as a salvation issue uh, there, there's a verse in Titus where Paul says, don't be foolish in disputes, genealogies, contentions, strivings. Uh, they're unprofitable. They're useless. He says not to give heed to fables and endless genealogies that cause dispute rather than godly edification and through faith. It, it seems like a lot of the original um, early church just were really mostly focused on the message of salvation through Christ and uh the, the fine line of does this word really mean that and that word really mean that was was not such of a big deal to them but I don't know I I, I don't I don't see this hardcore 
KJV thing in the same way. So I, I, I even understand what you just said there. You, you, you speak in a truth that the hardcore message behind the whole all of the scriptures that cannot be broken it is the gospel of grace, the good news. It, it really is. That is the hardcore message. But a lot of the problem occurs when words are changed and redefined because of modern translations and, and all other things that are occurring at the moment. It, it causes a, a lot of issues. You know, there's, there's many examples. I think the ESV, I think they call the bloodless Bible, where they where they remit so many times that it is the blood that is the remission of sins. Uh, they alter words and change meanings of words like faith and belief. They change what they really love to change the word repent in modern Bibles. Repent in modern Bibles and you know lexicons would say repent means to turn from sin or a cessation of sin when met, you know repent really means and you can even see it throughout the king james you don't need to go into the coin greek or, or the hebrew but it's clear in the in, in in the king james that repent is a change of mind nothing to do with forsaken sins if i may interject i i don't want to break in too much but and i know not a word of koine greek i do know hebrew and hebrew is a word for repent <laughs> is the same as the word for turn or turn around or go back. There's, yeah, but there's, the, the problem is there's, you have Schwab, you have quite a few different words and meanings, and they're always defined by the context. You know, in, in the Greek, you have five words for repent, and in, in the Hebrew, there's two, mm -hmm. and they're confused about a third. But mm -hmm. within, in, in regard to soteriology, salvation, Repentance is always a, a, a change of mind in regard to other things. You know, there, there's a, a change in direction, a change in action, and there's even a repent, amaletios, which means not to change your mind in regard to repent. But generally, repentance in the Old Testament and the New, regard to soteriology again, is always a change of mind never of uh, of i've got to do something i've got to turn away i've got to cessate from something it, it is a change of mind and and you know in the scriptures in the old testament 30 plus times god repented yeah but god can I, change his mind too i know some christians yeah. have an issue with that if god's all-knowing and omnipotent why would he change his mind well he has he, yeah it is certain things he can't change his mind over he can't change his mind about being him he can't change his eternal promises, but he can certainly change his mind in regard to, you know, w when he was going to cause destruction over Nineveh and, and, and all things like that. What about culturally? Culturally, yes. can can it change? Cult can some of the things that applied back in the day, can they not apply to today? Because there's a lot of things in the Bible that um, maybe were a culture and a time. Do you see any issue with us ignoring some of those rules from the past? Well, well, this is why you have the old covenant, literally old or old testament. You have the new covenant, new testament. Yeah, like like stoning the women that commit adultery. Uh, exactly. So, God, but what about in the new testament where it says women should wear head coverings and not teach men? Well, that's that's again, this is why context and even etymology to a group degree to see exactly what they're saying. Well, isn't that what it says? Yes, what it says, but look at the context, who it's talking to. That's hermeneutics, isn't it? The church. Paul's yeah, talking to the yeah, church. Yeah, but I know, but it's hermeneutics. Not only is he talking to the church, he's talking to a particular church. And in that particular church, there was a woman that shaved the head, you know, and, and you had a temple prostitute. You had a lot of stuff going on in Corinth that Paul had to deal with. So you have to, you have to confine the context about... You know, the, the long hair. Be so specific. If I may, it sounds like this is getting into a bit of a gnarly argument. Both of you have been talking, and Wendy, I believe, also is talking about the, you know, the KJV being, quote unquote, the one that's attacked more. What comes to my mind when I talk to Mandelaites is that 
most of the things they complain about being changed are things that are in any Bible, wolf and lamb, as Wendy pointed out, or someone whom I won't name has made a video denouncing the Bible verse in Genesis chapter 5 that says that Adam had sons and daughters. Or people have, and I don't understand why people are, are blaming it on a translation when they, you know, when some of these things that the Mandelaites complain against are things that are in any Bible because they aren't changed by this or that translation. Maybe well, re uh, redefine your, your question, Kate. Yeah. You, you I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. You and, you and the other gentlemen who were talking together just now uh, said a great deal about the KJV being the one that is primarily attacked. Primarily. It, right. It does, however, come to my mind that the things that the Mandelaites often actually complain against the most bitterly are the things that do not vary from translation to translation because they're simply what the words mean. Wolf shall dwell with the lamb is in every translation one way or another. Okay, mm -hmm. for instance, uh, someone a year or two ago made a video, a very well-known Mandelaite woman made a video denouncing Genesis 5 for saying that Adam had sons and daughters and for saying that Adam had Cain and Abel and Seth among his sons and she had not heard of Seth. So if she hadn't heard of it, of course, she said it couldn't be there. And that, of course, is something that's in all translations. Why do they seem to have a special hatred for that sort of thing? Well, I think you're talking about EYA's channel, right? Uh, yeah, I didn't want to name names, but well, correct. she's got she's got a lot of verses out there. I can't I can't speak for her. I don't have that same experience. I mm -hmm. I don't. In fact, I don't like to talk about verses that I'm not certain about. I can tell you, I've seen two change before my eyes, and then I'm hmm. very sure about the um, the wolf thing because I had a pretty pretty good anchor memory on that one. But you could just say I I thought you could say my memory's wrong, but uh, I have had two that that were very strong. Which and then there's some if I may ask, which were the ones that changed before your eyes? I saw wine skins change the bottles while I was on the and I was you mean you over were with my literally look opening the book, looking at the word wine skin, seeing the <coughs> say the, the letter uh, W in it, yep. and literally seeing the W change to a B, the I change to an O, and so yes. on. Yes, yes, exactly. And what was the other one? The other one was uh, a passage about uh, the wheat and the tares. What did you see change in that one? Um, God was directing me to read Mark chapter 4, and it started out mm -hmm. with the wheat and the tares, and then it, it changed right before my eyes, and all the words switched from black to red. Oh, so in other words, am, am I so were you reading this in a red-letter Bible, or were you reading it in a Bible that was, that was supposed to be all black? Yeah, that it started out um, in the morning. There was a series of incidents that happened the night before. I, I did a video explaining it, and I thought, well, maybe this is a direction to read Mark chapter 4. So I started reading Mark chapter 4 in the morning, and I thought, well, this is appropriate. It's talking about the separation of the wheat and the tares. Mm. And I put it down and thought I'd just read the rest of it when I got to work. When I got to work, I just did the computer thing, pulled it up on screen. Started reading, it was reading the same way, separation of the wheat and the tares. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the screen went through a kind of a flash and a double flash, like just a static flash. Mm -hmm. I'd never seen uh, a change happen quite in that fashion before. I've never seen mm -hmm. um, that long. Usually they're pretty quick, but uh, this one did that. Um, the wheat and the tares disappeared. And uh, the letters that were black were, all became red. You mean you said moment. the same thing, but the black letters became red. And the beginning part, which talked about the separation of the wheat and the tares, was gone. What did it say at first, and what did it say after it changed? 
It was speaking about the separation of the wheat and the tares. No, but what were the exact words, if you remember? This was probably a year and a half ago. I am sorry. Okay, I quite. But I'll, I'll get, I'll, since you're on this point, um, you had mentioned in my comments on one of my videos that uh, you had memorized uh, the KJV since you were five years no, old. No, I haven't That's, memorized it. I've read it. My memory is right. good. I have to read it. I'm sure you have a wonderful. No, memory. but you were you were saying I, that. I read it through once over comment. here. That doesn't mean I memorized it. It means I remember well, it, a lot. But I'm not a memory expert. It said that you had the the verse memorized since you're a kid I never five said, years old you know, if you look at my comments i did not claim to have memorized the kgb i you did, did claim to thing. be reading it at the age of five yes reading is not memorization as I'm you were reading the kjv it. at the age of five yes i i look i know how i know how to read i was able to read and i my mom had shown me how to use a dictionary to help with the hard words because she didn't want me to bother her coming up and asking, you know, Mommy, what's adultery? You know, she didn't want that. Yeah, if you were reading at five, you were far more advanced than I am. And then to remember it mm -hmm. is even more so Well, impressive. I don't remember it from reading it at age five. I've read it through every year. If I had a marvelous memory, presumably I would not have to do that. But there are, there are several things that I do read through on a regular basis, such as every year. The KG, KJV is one of them. I do want to thank you for sharing your experiences that really hit home for you about seeing words change on the page. I have, I have one question for you. You, you know that I, I mean, you know that I think that what you've said is consistent with expectations being bumped into by reality as i discussed i don't want to go into that again but may i ask you what further experience if you should have it one fine day would convince you that your current understanding was wrong that what experience could or might convince you that your experience of seeing things change on the page was simply what i think it is namely uh, namely a memory effect, so to speak, not a Mandela effect. So just, I pulled up the, the, the statement that was exact because I don't have that good of a memory. It says, yes, I remember those milk slash breast sentences being in the Bible. Yeah. I first I read them. I, I first read, them. I first read them when I was five and now I am 55. They're real. Face it. So I said, yeah. are you honestly telling me? I did not use the word memorize. I used the word remember to remember something is very different i remember having watched the news yesterday and seen something about donald trump and russia but that doesn't mean that i sat down and memorized the statement and could tell you so, verbatim it does it does mean that if you were to come to me and if you were to say oh you didn't see anything about trump and russia in the news kate you saw something else i would be able to say no, I remember having seen about Trump and Russia in the news. I didn't. I do want to thank you for quoting my statement, but you will note that I did not use the word memorize. To remember something is not the same thing as to commit it to memory. I can remember. I've been in Canada. I can remember what the national Canadian national anthem sounds like, but that doesn't mean I memorized it. So. It's okay for you, you to use the argument, though, that you remember something, but not for someone who remembers no, something I, in the I'm Mandela not effect. I'm going to use the argument that you remember it. I will simply point out that my memory is the one that the facts witness to and that your memory is not. So, so maybe the milk breast thing is not something that you remember because memory could no, be wrong. No, I remember having read it. It's so true, when you say that... When I was five years old, sir. So when you say that... That's isn't that the same thing as me saying I remember the lion shall lay with the lamb? Okay, you remember it, and I, you remember something, and I remember something. Your memory is not corroborated by written evidence, and my memory is. The question is then. Well, there's a good question. Is, excuse me for being interrupted. Your memory, sir, by your own admission, is not corroborated by the written evidence and my memory again by your own admission is so 
that's that's the good question. So the the, the evidence that that's the whole problem, and this is why Mandela effect people are so bonded together because we're in such of a minority because reality does fight against what we say we're we're truly happening to us. Reality is changed, and reality itself will testify against us. So you're you're in good hands with that argument, and that's what's so profound about this experience is because we know we know with without any shadow of a doubt we know and if, it, if we let, didn't let, feel let that me, let me um, um, answer my let me let me that. jump in and because I, I i do want to address scott with 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 this as as far as um you know because kate is is uh very specific in what she says she remembers about isaiah uh 11 6 scott saying you know he remembers something differently okay and of course we would you know those on the um they're not being mandela effects we would say okay well we have actual you know evidence to to show that okay even if it was me my memory obviously is wrong because the evidence says otherwise okay well of course then the mandela effect side is going to say okay well i mean that quantum d wave computer they're going in and they're changing all this residual evidence you know they're changing concordances they're changing bibles they're changing dictionaries okay just want to you know lay lay, lay set, set this up okay well what would you do scott okay in your every day-to-day -day life you know when you're out there uh in your job i mean because you obviously also uh believe that you see uh secular mandela effects okay well what and i'm gonna give you a scenario okay what would you do and, and i want you to think about this scenario like seriously i mean try to picture this actually really happening to you okay well what would you do if you got a call from say uh your your mortgage lender on on your house and let's say that person also believed in mandela effects and for some reason now there's uh there's no record that you've ever made your mortgage payments you know you probably would have sent in um uh, a physical check which You'd either have uh, an electronic copy of that or you'd get your canceled checks back. Well, they've now said, okay, we have no record of you ever paying your mortgage because, I mean, and obviously this must be a Mandela effect because CERN can go in and, and uh, mess up a uh, matter, okay? Well, that's going to mean you're going to lose your home, okay? Well, for you, what would you do? I mean... Would you just say okay and just let them take your house? Or would you be looking for your canceled checks to take to the bank manager and say, no, 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 no. I've, I've got my canceled checks right here. It shows on July 1st, 1998, here's my payment. August 1st, 1998, you know, all these years that you've made your payments, and uh then what would you do if they said well we can't accept residual evidence like that even though yes you physically got this evidence in your hands but that's just how the uh the the mandela quantum effect works what would you do scott and and i want you to answer this honestly if this really happened to you perfect yes um first I've got to say that I do know that reality can change in the blink of an eye. Everybody around me can be in a different mindset and forget conversations that we just had yesterday. I also um, don't know about CERN or deep wave hundred percent. I, I think there's some creepy things that go on there. If you look into it, it doesn't seem right, but I don't know. I, I'm not a physicist. I don't know about that stuff. I know that in physicist talk, if you listen to leading physicists now, uh, the the trend seems to be going that our reality 
didn't spawn into existence on its own, that it actually is dependent on an outside source. An outside source is responsible for this reality, and it may be able to modify and make changes to it. And I do, I, I more than believe, I know that it can be changed, and I believe an outside source does that. So in answer to the question of if I've experienced a scenario like that, yes, I've absolutely experienced that numerous times. And when it comes down to worrying about life, I don't anymore. I have no fear. I don't care anymore. It's all in God's hands. And I know that God's not letting anything happen to me that it's not his will. And if it's his will, if it's his will that tomorrow the bank say, I'm taking your house and you're homeless. And my wife says, I'm done with you. You're gone. And I'm, if I'm living under the streets starving. I'm 100% okay with that. I am not here. I'm not part of this world anymore. I don't care. And it's 100% God's power to do this. See, I believe that God is protecting me and changes that happen are things that he's allowed for a very real message. So I, I have had, I can give you experience after experience in my videos where reality changed profoundly just like that, even at work. And, and it's no different than that with the mortgage scenario. It's ex almost exactly like that. I'm, I'm going to have to bid you all farewell and Godspeed. It's, it's nearly two o'clock in the morning over in England. Okay, well, thank you very much, Bill, for, for coming on, you know, just e even for the short amount of time that um, <clears throat> that you did. I, I, I really appreciate that, and I enjoyed uh, the things that, that you talked about as well. Okay, thanks. It was good to hear from you. So Take again, care, Bill. Get yeah, some rest. Take care and God bless. All right, God bless. God bless. Well, I, I guess, I mean, you know, th thank you you for you know your your thought out reply to me that just i mean and i don't mean this to be rude uh i mean obviously i also know that that god is um watching out for me he's he's got my back but that to me seems like a cop out to to word it that way i mean if something like that happened to me i would be like you know no 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 I, I would at least be doing what, what God gave me the brain to do, okay? I'd be getting my, my canceled checks, okay? Now, maybe I couldn't persuade the bank manager to change his mind. Yeah, I, I get that. But that, that would be pretty uh, devastating in anyone's life if that happened to them. Would you it, like it really the specifics? Of my example, yes, uh, okay. if, if you if you feel comfortable sharing oh, that, yeah. Scott, sure. absolutely. So uh, one of them that happened, um, I was called to um, take a look at a railing that had broken, safety issue, stairwell. I uh, I went over to the broken railing. I called uh, one of my guys to come work with me because he had tools and I was a manager. We fixed it. A week later, I got a work order saying that uh, the railing was broke. I was upset thinking that the person assumed that I didn't fix it when it was called on the radio and that they just put that in as an extra. So I went over there to prove to my mind that this was done. I got over there. It was completely this, the way it was. And the way we fixed it, it just couldn't do that. I called the guy that I worked with on it. We worked together for a half an hour the, the week prior. I said... How do you how do you think this is possible? This we fixed this just last week. He said, "No, we didn't." I said, "You don't remember fixing this with me?" He did not. He had no memory of it at all. We fixed it together, but he does not remember it. Another thing that happened that I believe is a reality change is my my mother had severe cancer in both her lungs, and we were planning to go out there for the funeral soon. We figured she'd be passing soon, and then. One day she goes to the doctor and there's nothing there. It's just all gone and no explanation. I believe that there's an outside source that can change reality. I could be given something tomorrow to die and or I could be saved just as miraculously. I have no problem with that. Well, about your mother, um, was she aware? That, I mean, it sounds like she was aware that, that she had cancer in both lungs. Is, is, am I correct on that? Yep, going through the chemo. Okay, and then she goes back for, for more tests and the cancer is gone. Could that not have been just a miracle of God? Yes. Why does that have to, why does that have to be a Mandela effect? 
I don't see a difference. Hmm. Well, I, I guess just because I honestly relate the Mandela effect to, you know, the, the working of, of Satan uh, in, in deceiving people, I certainly wouldn't count a, a miracle like that to be the working of Satan. Although, yeah, I, I suppose Satan can, can um, do counterfeit miracles too, but... I mean, and and I don't know, Kate. Do you have um, any reply as to the the railing? I don't know, as I wasn't there, and I'm the first to admit that we don't understand everything that happens in this world. And the more honest a scientist is, the more they will admit that. So I don't know what happened to the railing, other than that. In my own life, I've literally known people to be mistaken about what they fixed or broken or, or had broken or had removed or whatever. I've seen this happen with things that I was fixing around the house. To me, it's easier, far easier for me to assume that just one or two people's memories might be at fault. After all, our brains are very fragile and changeable little things than to assume that something solid and outside ourselves have been changed. And if it came to a situation where a railing had broken, had been fixed, people knew it had been fixed, but it obviously hadn't been, I would a million times find it easier and more sensible to assume that this happened to a railing, a little piece of wood or iron someplace, than to assume that something like this had happened to billions and billions and billions of printed Bibles all over the world back through time. For instance, we've been talking, you've been talking about the wolf and the lion, uh, lion, wolf versus lamb, lion versus lamb. If I were to ask you a question, what Bible, what scripture or version of Isaiah do you think Jesus was reading when he was a little boy growing up in the Holy Land. Do you think, in other words, that he had the wolf shall dwell with the lamb and his copy of, you know, the scroll of Isaiah when back when it was all, you know, scrolls? Or do you think that he had something with the lion in our reality and that in some other reality out there, there was another Jesus sitting down and reading about the wolf? You're trying to keep time in a, in a, in a frame that your mind can understand it in this linear frame. Really, there's just now, but our minds are not going to grasp how reality is stitched together. God told Job that in chapter 28. He, we're just, he's too big for us. We weren't there when he made it all. Even, even our perception of time might be just temporary to give us a human experience. We don't really know what, what it's all about or how it works. I would agree that reality is bigger. That, there was a famous scientist, J.B.S. Holding, who said not only reality is stranger than we imagine, but it's also stranger than we can imagine. So, so, and I believe he was saying the same thing that you are. But mm -hmm. if Jesus existed, you know, and leaving aside whether he was God or whether he was just a person, you know, he grew up reading the scriptures and either he had scriptures where the book of Isaiah mentioned a lion as the first animal in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6, or one where it mentioned the wolf. What do you think he had? Well, I think that goes back to a debate amongst uh, the Mandela Effect people, because um, a lot of Mandela Effect people who believe in no things have changed. When it comes down to how this works, the, the fabric of reality, you will hear a few different um, theories and it's very popular to discuss whether or not we are in a fixed reality that's modified and changed or if somehow we are merging with realities that are parallel in some ways and they're crashing together I can tell you it's the, from the experiences that I've had sometimes it feels like I'm in a completely different place and everybody around me forgot of the conversations and everything the way something just existed I was in a reality where VIX had no K on it. It was just V-I-C-S. I saw it, saw the commercials. I knew it as V-I-C-S. 
And then one day it was VIX, V-I-C-K-S. And at the time it was VIX, I was thinking, isn't it supposed to have a K? But I wasn't sure. The V-I-C-S <laughs> seems so normal and right. My mind was just just saying, yeah, I, I, that feels right. But I had a notion of a K. Now, of course, now it's got the K and it's never been V-I-C-S. And it's <laughs> it feels like I was in a different place. But then there's others that I see hybrids and blending and it almost feels like this place has been hacked and there's been some changes that have been very very specific to me almost as if an entity outside of this world was just doing it to mess with mess with me because you know it, I, I don't know that god is doing it directly or if he's allowing um, other things to do it uh, god allowed satan to mess with job but he allowed it I, I i don't think these things i know these things i i don't have to say i think because i i had to i i had to talk to god about it because i was seeing them and I was getting creeped out. And I know that they can only do what they're allowed to do. They can only do what, what God allows according to the framework and the rules that he set up. And this is why I say to people, if they will focus on being honest in everything they do, it protects themselves. Because when we are dishonest with ourselves, with each other, and with God, we open them up for those demons or whatever they are to work their magic in us. They take us over. So there, there's rules out there, and, and we have to really be true and right right now. This, I think this is all about the writing on the wall. I think these are messages and signs that God wants us to get right with him right now, because whatever's coming next, whatever stage we're at, being pure is very, very important, and asking for help, not thinking that we can do this on our own, not assuming that we're infinite in our own understanding and power, but being humble before God and asking him to help us through this. But I see signs and I see messages in these statements. It's a, it's a writing on the wall and it's for the whole world. Everybody can see it. It's good to hear you admit honesty. All we can do in the end is try to be honest with ourselves. I think. Well, um, I, I think this, we could probably go on for, for many, many more, more hours. Uh, you know, obviously, Scott um, has, has his own um, views on this. I obviously have my, my own views, and, and, and hopefully, um, between all of us, you know, even when Bill came in, that we were uh, cordial and respectful amongst uh, each other. But uh, if, if it's all right with you, I, I would like to just say a few closing things because um, I, I don't think we're, we're honestly going to really go anywhere. Uh, you know, we're, we're already at, um, oh, an hour and 45 minutes almost. So the only okay. thing I would like to um, say to everyone is it's pretty important that you know who Jesus Christ is. And for me, Scripture is what tells me who Jesus Christ is. Okay? And just remember, the wilderness temptation, Jesus didn't use when, when he was being tempted those three times by, by Satan. He didn't use, he, he, even though he's God in the flesh, and, and fully man, he didn't use any um, man-made wisdom. What did he use? He used scripture. And when, when I see that Jesus has always been our example, okay, well, I see, okay, Jesus used scripture as the example of how we are to defeat Satan. Because Jesus said... It is written. And then he just quoted scripture to Satan. Well, it's going to be very, very hard for Mandela affected people. You know, and, and this is just my, uh, my opinion to, to really walk with the Lord and not use scripture because scripture is supposed to be the, the sword of truth. How can you fight using your sword to fight off all of the, the fiery darts that the enemy sends you if you're just relying 
on on your own self. Jesus himself, when one on one with Satan, he 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 used scripture and scripture alone. But what do you guys have? I mean, in in some ways, yes, you will use scripture, but it's almost like you're contradicting yourself. In, in the same sentence, how can you think scripture is going to work for you maybe half of the time when, when you think it's okay to use it, but then in the next breath, you say, well, it's, it's being changed. You're taking the power away that Jesus Christ gave you to be able to defeat Satan because he was our example and showed us how to defeat Satan, and you've just handed your sword to Satan. And so, therefore, you've handed all your armor over to the enemy. You're on the battlefield, and this is a battle to the death. You've taken off all your armor. You've just handed over your sword, and you're out there left naked on the battlefield. And if you do think you have a sword... You just have a toy sword. Do you think Satan's going to play fair and nice with you? He's going to absolutely destroy you because you've been willing to lay down your sword and lay down your armor. And so that's that's what I want to close out with. Um, I'll I'll let uh, I'll, I'll let Scott say any um, closing uh, remarks that he would like to say. I'll I'll then uh, let Kate say anything else and then we will bid everyone good night I, go ahead Scott I, I, did you have any closing comments that you wanted to say Scott yeah I would, I would say that if the verse about wineskins came up and Satan was standing in front of me I'd probably use the wineskins one I'm not necessarily a KJV so there's lots of different translations and uh, I, I feel like the, the, the concept still comes across I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that got to work out that situation if it ever, ever does come up. I thank you. I want to ask you since you, you know, mentioned the the bit with the wine skins a lot. Would you do me the favor of looking up on some site like etymology online just how early or rather how late the word wine skins came into the English language? And then ask yourself why you think it was in the English language as far back as 1611. Okay. I thought it beat bottles. Actually, I'm asking you to look up the word wineskins. The word bottles has been around a lot longer than the word wineskins. Remember that, as you will probably find out if you look up the history of the word bottles. Also, the word... Uh, bottles actually didn't always refer to just glass ones. Leather bottles are, are bottles too. I mean, we still have hot water bottles which are flexible like leather. But specifically what I asked you to look up was look up wineskins. And if you look up some sources on the history of that word, You'll see that we didn't really need to call certain bottles wineskins until most bottles were not wineskins. Sadly, reality doesn't play fair with us. History changes on me all the I time. I think reality is the only thing that can play fair with us. If reality doesn't play fair with us, there's no bloody sense in caring about God, who, so I have always been told, invented reality. Yeah, I've just seen it change, that's all. All right, guys. Well, um, I, I think overall this was uh, a pretty good uh, debate. I mean, other than the atrocity that I saw in the, the, the chat room, y'all are responsible for what, what you did there, okay? I, I tried to the very best of my ability to, to try to help keep uh, a handle on that. But it was really hard for me to really listen to what Scott was saying and understand if I'm just focusing on the chat room. So I, I, I honestly, I, for the most part, I had to give up on that so that I could really listen 
uh, with my heart to to what Scott was saying. And Me Scott, too. I I, I want to thank you for for being willing to come on and speak with with me and Kate and even Brother Bill um, respectfully. And, uh, you know, I, I just want to say thank you very much for being willing to to do this because other people aren't willing to to do this or or let other people come on and, and debate them. So I just want to thank you, Scott, very, very much. Okay, so um, I guess I will go ahead and um, close this out. I just uh, I want to thank everyone who did show up, and I will just bid everyone blessings and shalom. We'll see you next time.